Hi, hello, welcome once again on my scientific channel Discover Social Sciences. In this update I, am, I will do a little bit of thinking and reading aloud in connection with a recent investigation or a recent insight I had into the financials of two big companies or of two giants in the digital business. Namely, I had some insight into the financials of Alphabet on the one hand, so the mothership of Google, and into the financials of Microsoft on the other hand. And uh, essentially, I was doing all that in connection um, with an earlier observation that uh, cloud computing starts to emerge into like a separate part of the digital industry, into like a digital business on its own rights. And it essentially means that servers and data sets, which 20 years ago were supposed to be just instruments for other types of digital technologies, now they are becoming like an economic good in themselves. So server power, server space and access to data uh, becomes like an economic good, a value added in itself. So, uh, I want to wrap my mind around that phenomenon, especially that when I went through those financials of uh, Alphabet and Microsoft, I noticed things which, well, partly I was expecting it, but not quite. I thought that those giants were free of that, but Oh, okay, I will come to that. So, first of all, uh, you can find the detailed written analysis uh, that I made of those financials on my blog, Discover Social Sciences. The link is in the description box below the video. Uh, on that blog, I placed an update titled uh, Time for a Revolution. Uh, this is because Alpha Bay people claim that they make technological revolutions, essentially, that this is their job. So you can find a written account of what I am going to discuss here, orally, in that update on my blog. And here I go into a slightly different direction, a direction which I frequently follow myself and which I encourage my students to follow. It is uh, to reach to the classics of economic sciences, so to understand uh, what is happening now. The logic behind is that so those so-called classics of economics usually wrote their books when there was a lot of things going on around them. So those books, which today we deem as classics of microeconomics or, or of economics in general, are writings written down when some important social change was going on. And for my reading today, I chose Joseph Schumpeter, Business Cycles. So the book published in 1939, uh, which gives essentially an account of uh, what Joseph Schumpeter, an economist from the so-called Austrian school, experienced and thought about the social and technological change he experienced. Now it is worth knowing that at the end of the 19th century, and the first half of the 20th century, <clears throat> it was a time of astonishingly quick technological change, or maybe not quick, but very deep. It was a moment when even uh, an otherwise incremental change in technologies was working like a sweeping technological change, like a hurricane going through the entire social system. And Joseph Schumpeter was trying very largely to wrap his own mind around it. And in that video, I want to do some reading from his theory of innovation uh, expressed in that book, Business Cycles. Uh, it is once again, somehow some thinking aloud from my part. Anyway, we go. So here I browse quickly through the table of contents 
and I go to what I am the most interested in, the theory of innovation. Let's just see how it fits into the screen. Maybe it is advisable for me to become a little bit smaller in that screen so as you have a better view of the writing. Okay, so the theory of innovation. And Joseph Schumpeter writes, we will now define innovation more rigorously by means of the production function previously introduced. This function describes the way in which quantity of product varies if quantities of factors vary. If instead of quantities of factors we vary the form of the function, we have an innovation. I will stop by this one and connect quickly to that case of Alphabay and Microsoft and to their financials. What I can notice in the financial statements of both Alphabay and Microsoft is that they hold in their balance sheets consistently more and more liquid financial assets. So more and more cash and more and more highly liquid financial securities. And that type of assets, so current financial assets, seems to be taking an, an, a growing percentage of the overall capital base in those two big businesses. Now, what I know uh, by observation of other businesses, digital or others, is that whenever a business today faces quick technological change, like quick technological race in their environment, they do something which at the first sight seems counterintuitive. Instead of massively investing in productive assets, so instead of massively investing in technological assets, those people in the presence of quick technological race start to accumulate massively cash and liquid financial securities. In the beginning, I couldn't understand why, but now as I thought about it and I did more research about it, I think I know. It is uh, that in the presence of very quick change, what you want most of all is, is to stay flexible and adaptable. The philosophy behind it is that uh, the, in the presence of quick change, anyway, I am very likely to be always lagging behind that change uh, to some extent. So the most important thing is to stay flexible. And the cash and highly liquid financial uh, assets give flexibility because it is money which is accessible like that quickly without having to negotiate with banks, without having to negotiate with investors. We just have that pillow of quickly accessible money which allows us to move in any direction we want very quickly. Uh, there is that saying, which I heard, I think, 10 years ago or more, that in the times of uncertainty, cash is king. And this is really true when I observe the financials of Alphabay and Microsoft. So in the context of what Joseph Schumpeter writes, hmm, the production function describes the way in which quantity of product varies if quantities of factors vary. But if instead of quantities of factors, we vary the form of the function, we have an innovation. What is my point? The capital base, the structure of capital used by those huge tech companies, that structure is changing. Uh, it goes more and more towards, uh, uh, towards highly liquid financial assets so as to stay flexible. So we have a different production function now. We have a growing output of digital goods and services from their part, because as judging by their revenue, the output is growing in their business. Yet that growing output is supplied by a relatively smaller and smaller base of strictly speaking technological assets and a growing base of, well, of money, of flexibility. 
So this is somehow an innovation. I am still wrapping my mind around it. And once again, this video is like a collection of loose thoughts from my part. But this is like a, like a real phenomenon. Uh, those guys change their production function and we we have something like <laughs> I, I hesitate to call it a miracle, but we have something strange. Digital goods and services are being made to an in to a growing extent with money more than more than with anything else. OK, let's go further with Joseph Alois Schumpeter. So, innovation. But this not only limits us, at first blush at least, to the case in which the innovation consists in producing the same kind of product that had been produced before, by the same kind of means of production that had been used before, but also raises more delicate questions. Therefore, we will simply, we will simply define innovation as the setting up of a new production function. This covers the case of a new commodity as well as those of a new form of organization, such as a merger, of the opening up of new markets, and so on. Recalling that production in the economic sense is nothing but combining productive services, we may express the same thing by saying that innovation combines factors in a new way, or that it consists in carrying out new combinations, although, taken literally, the latter phrases would also include what we do not now mean to include, namely, those current adaptations of the coefficients of production which are part and parcel of the most ordinary run of economic routine within given production functions. So, once again, interrupting to drop my coin into the narrative by Joseph Schumpeter. What I notice it the, is that the production function of uh, those digital businesses is more and more or to a growing extent made of money, quite simply. So it is more and more money consuming. Those digital businesses, in order to grow, and we know they grow, need more and more money in the balance sheet per unit of real output of digital goods and services. Which means, for example, that if today you start a new digital business. If you set up a startup company in the digital industry, you need to be thinking more and more about the amount of cash you have piled up in your balance sheet in terms of flexibility. It is like a new quality or a new frame of mind, a new strategy, uh, which is progressively emerging. We need more and more money per unit of digital output. Let's go further with Joseph Schumpeter. For cases in which innovation is of the technological kind, we could have defined it directly with reference to the so-called laws of physical returns. Barring indivisibility or lumpiness, the physical marginal productivity of every factor must, in the absence of innovation, monotonically decrease. Innovation breaks off any such curve and replaces it by another which, again except for indivisibility, displays higher increments of product throughout, although, of course, it also decreases monotonically. Or if we take the Ricardian law of decreasing returns and generalize it to cover industry as well, we can say that innovation interrupts its action, which again means that it replaces the law that had so far described the effects of additional doses of resources by another one. In both cases, transition is made by a jump from the old to the new curve, which now applies throughout and not only beyond that output, which had been produced before by the old method. Now, returning to my observations about the digital business. If you have in your in your balance sheet, in your capital base, as a digital business person, if you have the strictly speaking technological assets and you have money as a current asset which you need to stay flexible, what we are witnessing now is that as those digital businesses add to the pile of cash they hold, so as, do, as they add to their financial flexibility, 
they have increasing returns in terms of real output from one unit of technological assets. Here we have that crazy phenomenon that in the presence of a growing amount of money held at hand, one unit of computational power in servers gives more output, more real business output in those businesses. And this is a little bit mind-blowing, but this is precisely what we mean by innovation. In the digital industry, those people are somehow figuring out a new pattern of doing business, which is not just technological, but financial. And, uh, well, this is strange, but this is, how, but this is how civilizations change. You have a very good illustration of that now. Okay, let's go over the finish line with Joseph Schumpeter, like a nice conclusion. We can define innovation although with reference to money cost. Oh, total costs to individual firms must, in the absence of innovation, and with the constant prices of factors monotonically decrease in function of their output. Whenever a given quantity of output costs less to produce than the same or a similar quantity did cost or would have cost before, we may be sure, if prices of factors have not fallen, that there has been innovation somewhere. You see, we have a different employment of money now in the digital business and it is a signal of innovation happening somewhere. It would be incorrect to say that in this case innovation produces falling long-run marginal cost curves or makes in certain intervals marginal cost negative. What should be said is that the old total or marginal cost curve is destroyed and the new one put in its place each time there is an innovation. If there are indivisibilities and the innovation becomes possible only beyond a certain quantity of output, while below it the old method remains superior and would promptly be resorted to again, should output fall sufficiently we may indeed draw one cost curve to combine costs with the old method in one interval and costs with the new method in another interval. But this is possible only when the new method has become familiar and the whole system is adapted to it, which means that it enters the production functions, the practical range of choice open to all, and is no longer an innovation. And now the big question is, what kind of new business pattern, what kind of new production function is emerging in the digital business. Certainly, we have the emergence of cloud computing, so a growing importance of servers uh, or of uh, capacity and efficiency of servers. So the digital business is turning into like a big factory pattern, into a big factory paradigm. It seems like a new era or a new wave of division of labor. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that little bit of economic sciences and I strongly encourage you to follow my blog on discoversocialsciences.com as you can find in the description box below the video. And well, have fun with science and have fun with life. Bye.